Okay, we're going to continue with our discussion about the marketing mix or the dimensions of marketing strategy part two, right? Where we're going to discuss about the other two piece of the four piece that we haven't covered so far. So let's start with place. Now place, and this is a name that is used just so that the idea of the four P's are indeed four P's. Most people will call instead of place, they will call it distribution. Okay, so what is distribution or what is place? So distribution is basically how you get the product or service from the manufacturer or the person that is providing the service all the way to the consumer that is actually going to uh, purchase and use the product, right? So it's basically a whole host of organizations that enable you to basically take the product and uh, make sure that it's available at the time uh, and on the place where it's needed by the consumer, right? Um, now, most of the marketing channels are uh, created by a set of companies that are called middlemen or intermediaries, right? So these are the companies that don't make anything per se, but what they do is they provide a service. They make sure that that product or service makes it all the way to uh, the customers that are really interested in buying it. Right? So these are companies like Walmart or Target or Amazon, right? That they basically don't manufacture anything, but they make sense that the goods that you are actually interested in buying are close to you or maybe at your place in the case of Amazon, right? And when you want them and when you need them, right? And so these companies, uh, I want to make sure that you guys realize, are providing a service, a service that is actually valuable, right? So they create utility of time, right? So if you really need to buy a product right away, maybe Amazon is not the way to go because even though they've been working really hard on improving the time, that it takes for the products to arrive to you and getting them instantaneously is still not an option for the most part, right? And so if you want something right away, maybe you actually need to go to a physical store, right? Because being at the store, having the product in there provides time utility for you. You can just get the product right now, right? Place utilities, you can get it right here, right? That's why vending machines are so popular, right? Because instead of having to go to the store, the store can come to you in a way, right? So you have easier access to products. Convenience stores are the same way, right? So there is such thing as place utility, right? Having that product available to you where you are, right? And ownership comes from the fact that the product's actually in stock, right? That they actually have the product in there. If you go to the store and the shelf is empty for the product that you're interested in, and uh, it's a big bummer, right? So I want to make sure that you guys realize that this is actually um, a worthwhile and valuable uh, economic endeavor, right? Having a store is not an easy thing and it provides actually a lot of things that are useful for the consumer. So this idea that the middleman, the only thing they do is they charge a markup and they don't do anything for you. And it's quite honestly not true, right? And now within the middleman, one type of companies are called retailers. Right? Retailers are companies that sell product to the final consumer. Right? So who is the final consumer? Well, households and people like you and me, right? That are buying the product for their use and not to make money. If you're buying products to make money, then you will be considered a business. And because of that, um, a retailer that is selling to another business it's not acting as a retailer, it's really acting uh, like an intermediary, like some sort of wholesaler um, in that case, right? By the way, there are some companies that do both retail and wholesale, okay? But to keep it simple, uh, companies that sell to the final user um, are um, retailers, and retailers provide all sorts of services, and you have some examples here. We've already talked about price, place, time, and ownership utility. But, you know, sometimes they go beyond that. They might have some value-added services like extra warranties, for example, or maybe product support, right? So if you go to um, companies that are retailers like um, Best Buy, right, they have uh, services that help you uh, support the products that you buy at the store or maybe that you didn't even buy at the store, right, with the Geek Squad, for example, 
right? So retailers offer value to services, sorry, value to customers in different ways, okay? Now, there are in some situations where the company or the manufacturer might decide to provide the service directly to you. So what they are doing is they are using a very short channel distribution where there are no intermediaries in between, right? And we call that direct marketing or direct selling. Um, basically, direct marketing is when you just communicate directly to your customers uh, without having intermediaries in between. Okay, and direct selling is when you actually do that and you also uh, not only talk to them or promote your product, uh, like you would do, uh, for example, in an infomercial, but you actually also give them the choice to actually buy the product directly from you. Okay, that's what direct selling would be. The old-fashioned way, it would be made with a catalog or an infomercial, uh, but nowadays direct selling is the companies selling the product directly, for example, uh, using either social media or the website, right? Where they just tell you, hey, come to our website, we'll sell you the product directly. Some companies actually do this. And it's a different model. And what is the advantage? You keep more of the margin. What is the disadvantage? It's hard to reach people, although it, the internet has changed things quite a bit, and now it's easier to reach a wider audience. But having a whole host of retailers helping you get the product to a lot of people can actually be helpful, even though it does cost actually money, right? So your margins will be lower if you use a retailer or other middleman, but on the other hand, you probably will have higher reach, and because of that, you're gonna get two more customers. Now, who are wholesalers? Wholesalers are another type of intermediary that is part of the channel of distribution that usually, uh, usually no, they do not sell uh, directly to the final consumer, right? So these are companies that sell to other companies that are gonna later sell this, the product. So you might have a manufacturer, then you have a wholesaler uh, that you know sells the product to other wholesalers or other retailers. Okay? And the reason why they're useful is because they basically help break down the bulk of the order. So you might go from really large orders to smaller orders. For example, if you are a retailer like a small mom and pop shop, right, you might not be able to buy a really large order, so a wholesaler will enable you to maybe have access to products that otherwise you will not have enough purchasing power to actually access. Okay. Now, within wholesaler, uh, there is a type of wholesaler that is a little bit different than the others, and that is an agent. Now, an agent is different from a traditional wholesaler because it does not take ownership of the products. So traditionally, wholesalers will actually buy the product from the manufacturer and then sell it to other retailers or other wholesalers. But if something happens to the product, for example, in transit, after they send the contract, that is their product and they are the ones that need to deal with the problem. On the other hand, agents don't do that. Agents just get people together Right? They might have information about who the customers are or where they are, or they can help them negotiate, but they do not actually take ownership of the product. Okay, That's the big difference between an agent and a wholesaler, but it's still an intermediary that makes sure that the product actually gets to the people that are interested in buying the product. Now, what is supply chain management? Something that you might hear about. It's basically the art and science of making sure that these channels of distribution function as efficiently and effectively as possible, right? And so that means reducing cost, reducing waste, and, and maybe unnecessary movement, right? So being as efficient as it is possible so that you create, for example, a set of warehouses and, and routes that enable you to get those products to the destination where they are needed in a most cost-effective and efficient manner, okay? And now, there, you're gonna find that uh, channels of distribution are gonna be uh, different. Some are gonna be very elaborate, others are gonna be very simple, right? And what tends to happen, usually, if you're gonna generalize, is that when you're trying to reach the average consumer or the average household, because the order sizes tend to be small, getting there is gonna require a much more complex channel of distribution that is gonna involve more partners, typically. On the other hand, if you're selling to large organizations and large companies, what's gonna happen is most of the market, 
sorry, market. Most of the channels that you're going to be involved in in that situation, if you're selling to large man of, um, large organizations, are going to be a lot simpler. They're going to involve less uh, companies in between. Sometimes you're going to sell actually directly. Uh, you can see in the slide about 50% of all uh, business to business transactions are actually happening directly with the manufacturer of the product instead of having an intermediary in between. Let me show you that a little bit how it would look like graphic. Right? So we've talked about direct marketing and direct selling. Uh, this is a channel where you're selling directly. Right? So there are no intermediaries in between the producer of the product and the consumer. So it's direct sell. Right? There is no company in between. Okay. Then here you have a channel of distribution that is going to be involving at least one intermediary and because this intermediary sells directly to the final consumer right we're going to call them a retailer okay so retailer is a company that doesn't make anything and it makes sure that those products and or services get to the final consumer okay oftentimes however you have a situation like this where there is another company that also is an intermediary but does not sell directly to the final consumer it sells some of the products to retailers, a company like Granger, for example, right? Um, but Granger sells mostly to other companies, but, you know, they're going to be mostly a wholesaler, right? They don't sell to the final consumer at all, okay? And then some situations might require the use of even more complex channels of distribution where you might have multiple wholesalers multiple retailers that is very difficult multiple retailers right and because you can find coke in you know gas stations you can also find which are retailers by the way and you can find it at walmart you can find it at target it's not just only one type of retailer that is selling the product okay and then you have agents that don't take ownership of the product but make sure that you know the producer finds the right wholesalers for example Okay, so that the product actually ends up making it to the end of the channel, right? So the length of the channel, the longer it is, usually it enables you to reach a wider audience, right? Because there's going to be more companies involved that are going to enable you to have access to those customers that otherwise might be actually hard to find or reach if not find. Okay. Good. Now, within distribution, not only the length of the channel matters, but also uh, the intensity of the distribution strategy is a variable that you need to decide. Okay, You can have intensive distribution. This is where you make sure that the product gets everywhere. So if you're looking for retailers, you use a pretty indiscriminate um, strategy to try to get your product in as many retailers as possible. Okay. Selective distribution is when you only allow a few people uh, or a few companies in this case to sell your product, right? For example, in the case of watches, oftentimes you need to be an authorized uh, seller of the product. And otherwise, uh, you're selling the product in the gray market, which means it's legal for you to sell it, but you don't have the authorization of uh, the company that makes the product. Okay. Those are selective distributions. Now, this is going to enable you to reach less people than intensive distribution. So why would you do it? Because it gives you more control over who is carrying your product and what kind of brand perceptions are associated with that retailer. Right? So if you're trying to go, for example, more upmarket, maybe you don't want your product to be in certain retailers because those retailers are associated with more of a downmarket uh, trend. So you want to control to some degree how your product is perceived and one way of doing that is using selective distribution and finally you have exclusive distribution where you can only find uh, your products in specific uh, outlets or maybe where those outlets are not allowed to sell uh, any other products in the same product category right and what this enables you to do is enables you to even control more tightly um, um, who actually carries your product Right? And if you're worried about brand image, this is obviously a much more uh, direct way of controlling your brand experience, but comes at the cost of not having nearly as much of a reach. So you're going to have to balance these two when it comes to deciding what kind of strategy you're going to use 
for covering your market with your distribution channel. Final aspect that I want to touch upon when it comes down to uh, distribution is the idea of uh, physical distribution, especially, especially, you know, this is important when it comes down to products, not as much with services, unless services provide a certain product to be provided, right? And is the idea of logistics, which you probably will hear about, and it's basically all the planning and coordination of getting the products both into the company so they can actually make the product and also outside of the company so that the product can actually make it all the way to either the wholesaler, the retailer, or the final consumer, depending on the kind of strategy that you have chosen from your channel of distribution. Okay, and obviously uh, logistics is going to involve a whole host of physical management and aspects of the product from transportation, where you're going to have to maybe set up a fleet or hire somebody to do this transportation for you if you're outsourcing this to a company like uh, FedEx or UPS, right? And also, uh, it might mean the planning on where uh, your warehouses are going to be, that it's going to enable you to actually get those products in a more efficient and probably cost-effective way uh, to either the final consumers or your channel members, okay? And also, how do you handle the materials within the uh, chain, right? So what do I mean by this? What about, for example, returns, right? What's going to happen with the customer when they actually return the product because they are dissatisfied with it. You need to create also a channel distribution backwards, uh, reverse logistics, that is gonna enable you to get those products back uh, either to the manufacturer or to the designated company that is gonna be dealing with that particular aspect. And this is all an important thing that you're gonna to have to think through carefully when you're trying to set up your channel of distribution. Okay. And then from channels or place, we go to the last P, which is promotion. This is probably from all the P's, the one that you're most familiar with, and probably that is the case because it's the one that is most visible to the final consumer, right? So promotion is basically about communication of your products and services and experiences to the final consumer, okay? And maybe providing some incentive to buying the product, right? So this involves things like advertising, right? Which you know uh, all about. Personal selling, so using salespeople uh, to maybe solve the problems or doubts that people might have or questions that they might have about what kind of products are actually appropriate or necessary for the task that they're trying to accomplish, publicity or PR, right? And uh, maybe sales promotion, which is things like deals and coupons that are gonna give you an incentive to maybe in the short term be more likely to purchase the product. Now, the idea of integrated marketing communications, or IMC, is because you have all these different tools that are going to be used by the company to promote the product. What you need to do is you need to have an overall theme or a story that needs to be coordinating all these aspects in a way that they are uh, all telling you the same story, right? All the promotion mix elements that I've discussed and briefly before, need to be synchronized and essentially uh, telling a coherent and consistent story uh, to the final consumer, right? And the way to do this is basically by thinking about them all simultaneously instead of uh, treating this as a piecemeal approach, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about each of these four different elements of your promotion mix. So let's start with advertising. Now, this is probably the most visible aspect typically of uh, the marketing mix, right? Uh, and it's basically any non-personal communication that comes from the firm and is transmitted uh, via mass media to uh, the consumers, right? So this is, for example, when you're watching the Super Bowl and you see a commercial, right? So you're watching TV or whatever means you use to consume that content. I guess TV is not the obvious way anymore, right? But uh, the idea is this is a message that comes from the company and that you know the company has paid to have that message in there, especially in the Super Bowl. They will have paid a premium to be there because they know there's going to be a lot of people watching, right? So, good. Now, the way these commercials are done, usually promotionally done by an advertising agency, although there are other ways of using uh, maybe crowdsourcing to do that nowadays. Doritos is a good example of that. 
Maybe we'll talk a little bit about this when we talk about online uh, marketing, if we do. Um, but typically you'll use uh, celebrities, maybe a prototypical consumer or any other way of basically uh, telling a story uh, about why your product or service is the one that the consumer should be considering and thinking about, right? Everybody knows how advertising works. Okay. Uh, then you have personal selling. This is a, a different promotional uh, mix element, right? This is typically used for big ticket items. Uh, sales, uh, professional selling is expensive. Salaries, especially in the US, are high. So because of that, uh, you know, when you need to involve a person into the sales process, it needs to be justified, right? And, but the advantage of having a salesperson is that it is two-way communication with uh, the firm, right? With a representative of the firm, in this case, the salesperson. And that enables you to basically be most flexible, right? So if you have any questions about uh, how the product works or what kind of features are necessary for the kind of benefits that you're interested in. So for a particular job that you're trying to accomplish, which one will be the most appropriate of the products that are in your line of products and the salesperson is somebody who's going to be able to do this right now there are different degrees of knowledge and the salesperson and the kind of jobs that they are going to be assigned to is going to be reflective of the kind of information skill set that they actually have you have order takers who are people that are there just to take the order and very little more so because of that they tend to have lower levels of expertise or knowledge required for that position and also the kind of um, decision-making uh, capability that are going to have is going to be a lot lower. So if you're in a situation where you have a problem and you ask the salesperson to do something about it, if they cannot resolve it right then and there, you probably know that you're talking to somebody who is uh, doing more of this role. Right? You have creative salespeople. These are people that are given more leeway as to the kind of decisions that they can make. And because of that, they are also trained more and they have more information about the product category. The reason why you use this type of salespeople is when you're in a situation where um, the customer or the consumer is not gonna be uh, always bringing the same kind of problems. So uh, when new problems arise, you wanna have somebody who's capable of at least finding a potential solution uh, that will be acceptable for the consumer right in there, right? And then you have support salespeople who are the ones that are, are gonna be trained to provide support for existing products or products that have already been purchased, right? So slightly different variations, but other takers are the ones that will have the lowest uh, degree of information and uh, training, and also the ones that are gonna have less autonomy when it comes down to making decisions on the spot about how to handle a problem that is um, suggested or mentioned by the customer. Now, how do salespeople go about selling? Well, there are uh, many schools that teach uh, personal selling. It's uh, actually, it's a difficult thing to teach. Um, and you, there are a lot of tricks of the trade that are taught in these classes, some of which I will consider somewhat unethical. But uh, if you look at it from a process standpoint, uh, most uh, salespeople will agree that there is a whole host of steps that you need to actually go through before the sale is actually considered closed or finished, right? And you start with prospecting, which is basically finding people or customers that are potentially going to be interested in the product. This might involve, for example, cold calling firms that or, or customers that you might think might be interested in a product or a product solution. Uh, approaching, which will be ones that, you know, uh, you found the potential customers engaging them either you know life or uh, through other means to just try to uh, get their attention and talking to them uh, about uh, the situation and see if they're interested then presenting as you know discussing what kind of benefits uh, are unique to the product or solutions that you're providing or suggesting handling objections will be letting the customer ask any questions or difficulties that they see or reasons why that product or service will not be uh, their main choice or the first choice. Closing is when you actually convince the customer that uh, they sell, uh, it's going to be in their best interest and you go ahead and send the paperwork and get payment. 
And follow-up is making sure that the customer is actually satisfied with the product okay, or service. Now we've talked about advertising and personal selling. The next element in our promotion mix is publicity or public relations. This is when you use non-personal communication, but you don't pay for the message. Right? You still use mass media. You're still uh, not talking directly to the customer. You're using uh, mass media to do that, but you're not paying for it. Okay? And these are oftentimes presented as a news piece. So oftentimes uh, companies will write stories for news outlets about the company, and some of them will publish them or use them for their programs, right? And the idea behind these messages is they are trying to be uh, kind of like nudging the public uh, in terms of how they perceive the company without necessarily directly talking about buying any products. So if you're comparing advertising and publicity or public relations, and uh, you know, advertising can be informative and persuasive. Persuasive is when you're trying to convince somebody to buy something or change their opinions, right? But publicity tends to be just informative, right? They are trying to tell you stories, but they are not trying to convince you of something that, you know, you should be buying right then and there, right? And advertising usually is trying to ask you to do something, buy the product, try this, consider that, right? Whereas publicity or public relations doesn't do that. It's just trying to paint the company in a positive light, okay? And company directly pays for advertising. Publicity is free, at least free for the media outlet that it's receiving the story. Of course, it's not free for the company in the sense that you need to have somebody write down that story or create that story. Okay, so you're going to have to pay somebody for this. But uh, it's not paid by, by the media outlet. Okay which in the case of advertising, you do need to pay the media outlet to uh, air your uh, advertising, right? And advertising tends to be repetitive, right? So most of the times you're gonna come up with a schedule of how many times a day or a week or a month that ad is gonna be shown in whatever media outlet you're using. Whereas publicity usually only tends to show up one time. You might have multiple stories that you have created around some sort of thing and then you know you will see some sort of overlap but for the most part they are a one-time deal okay. now what about advertising in the internet age right things have changed a little bit although the basic of advertising um, stays the same but uh, new media have enabled companies to sway the public in other ways that are maybe a little bit less clear as to whether the company is paying somebody for to do this or not, right? For example, bus marketing, right? The idea of finding somebody, uh, maybe a celebrity or an influencer, whatever that means, that is going to be recommending your product using maybe social media, right? And so that you know you create some sort of word of mouth effect. But this word of mouth is not necessarily by people that are directly using the product. It's from these figures that are and influencers within uh, a social media environment, right? And this is kind of a new, um, this is kind of a new trend that you can see it's very, very successful. Right? The question is whether uh, this is part of publicity or advertising, right? Because oftentimes these influencers will get the product or products that they are endorsing for free, right? And Technically, they need to disclose this fact, right? So the moment that you're getting something for free, are you getting paid, right? So if it's something that costs a thousand dollars and you're getting it for free, you just got a thousand dollars worth of something that you could technically advertise or review, whatever that means, right? And then turn around and sell it on eBay, right? So are you getting paid? It's kind of a great area. There are some regulations that have come in the last few years. There is going to be more regulation because and a lot of people are making a lot of money this way. So it's coming and it's a little bit of free reign right now. You're supposed to disclose uh, that you're getting um, the products directly from the manufacturer, but uh, there's still some gray areas 
that are going to have to be uh, ironed out, and they will be. Okay, and then we have uh, sales promotion, which is the last element of your uh, promotional mix. This is basically when you provide a direct incentive for somebody to uh, get the product and purchase it uh, right now, right? Unlike advertising or PR, which is, you know, maybe asking them to buy it, but there is no direct incentive and there other than, you know, a communication coming from your part. This uh, sales promotion includes things like coupons or sweepstakes or uh, demonstrations or samples, right? When you go to the grocery store and they give you, I don't know, they give you sushi to try and see if you want to buy. I always want to buy sushi, but you know, sometimes you just get a little taste of sushi. My kids love it, right? Every time we go to the grocery store and they have sushi to try, you know, it's a great day, right? So they're giving you an incentive to buy the product and some incentives are monetary, others are just like in the case of samples. And getting to try it so that it reduces the risk that you're not gonna like the product because you've already known, you've tried it, you know the quality level, or at least you can ascertain it better because of that it stimulates uh, short-term demand for the product. Now, strategically, there are two distinct ways of setting up your strategy, right? We've talked about four uh, marketing mix elements and they don't all work the same, right? So you have push strategy and pull strategy. So this involves the channel distributions that we have discussed and promotion. So what is push strategy? Push strategy is when you provide incentives to the channel so they will try to convince your consumers to buy the product. For example, if you are the producer, right? You might be able to or willing to set up a quantity discount for your wholesalers and retailers. So the more units that they buy, the cheaper the price they get. And by doing so, you're incentivizing them to sell it or push that product to the consumer because they know that if they sell a lot of units, they're going to get the product a lot cheaper, right? So you're providing an incentive to uh, have maybe like a display at the store, right? Something that maybe your manufacturer is not directly playing for, but the retailer has decided to put in there because they know that with that quantity discount, they have an incentive to sell more units because you know the more units they sell the more money they're going to make right this is called push strategy because uh, the push comes through the channel for the consumer to buy the opposite to that or the alternative strategy is pull strategy where the producer directly talks to the consumer about how great the product is maybe through advertising right and because of that the consumer goes to the retailer and pulls from their product right so the idea that now they go and ask about the product if you don't have that product at the store talk to the manager so they start bringing the product because i'm interested about it because i've heard the advertising and it sounds like it's a great product right so these two strategies by the way they are not you know mutually exclusive you can use both right but conceptually they are very different so you need to understand how they function one works by uh, using the incentives that the channel has the other one and uh, targets directly the consumer and then hopes that the channel is going to catch up with it. You can use a mixture of both. Okay. Now, what are you trying to achieve at the end of the day with all these promotional tools that we have discussed? Uh, well, for the most part, uh, these are uh, short-term incentives, right? So what they are trying to do is they are trying to increase the number of sales. Okay. And in some cases, they might be able to manage the sales. So for example, if you are managing a bar or a restaurant, right? One thing that you're gonna have typically, let's say if this is a day, this is time, and you're looking at your number of customers, actually uh, Google Maps will give you a diagram that looks like this. If you type in a store, it will tell you how busy it is. It will give you some charts here. So what you will see for a restaurant, for example, let's say that this is noon, right? And so if you serve breakfast, right? So you might find that there are some people that come in the morning, right? And, and then you might have few people coming in between. Let's say that this is nine o'clock, right? And then what happens is around 11 o'clock, you're going to have more people. And then maybe at 12, you'll have the most people for lunch. And then, you know, 
you cannot tie it down again. And then let's say that six o'clock is here, and now you start having some more people for dinner. Let's say that this is a restaurant that serves mostly lunches. And then you have maybe a few people at seven and eight, and then the number of customers you have dies down again, right? So if you have a demand schedule that looks this variable, right, where you have very few people here and a lot of people here and very few people again and a lot of people again, what can you do to manage this? Well, you can give an incentive so that people will be more willing to come over here where you have a lot more capacity, but maybe you don't have anybody in there, right? And, and the way you do that is maybe having a happy hour. Right? So if you have a happy hour that starts, let's say, at 3 p.m. here, right? maybe you can give free and not free, maybe like half of drinks, right? Very typical. And in a situation like this, what you're doing is you're increasing, maybe shifting some of the demand from here and here so that you, know, you don't get so busy and you don't have enough tables to serve people during peak hours and you can stabilize sales. It enables you to have a more even sales profile, which is easier maybe to manage from a company perspective. Okay. Good. And then other than that, it might also be used for information, right? Uh, if you're not providing direct incentive, if you're just talking to your customer and, you know, to build the brand, build brand associations, etc., etc. Right. At the end of the day, uh, a lot of the advertising especially is used for positioning. Positioning is how you're perceived by the customer in their minds, right? So what does your brand stand for? That's that's the ultimate question behind positioning. And the way you build that story, of course, with the product, right? Product needs to match that story, but also by talking and communicating to your customer the story, maybe via advertising, any of the other tools, salespeople, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the last point that I wanna make. At the end of the day, we've talked about four Ps that are gonna create your marketing mix. Okay, and coordinating the efforts between those four is going to be a challenging task that if you do effectively, if your product matches your advertising, matches your pricing, matches the channels that you use, and everything works uh, telling a consistent and congruent story, you're going to do a lot better in the marketplace, right? So doing a good job in marketing is the reason why a lot of companies are extremely successful. Take a company like Apple, for example. Yes. They have world-class uh, industrial design. Yes, they have very uh, creative people uh, working for them. Yes, they have amazing capabilities in terms of R&D. Yes to all those things. But if you look at their competitive advantage, a lot of it, it's about marketing, right? And yeah, that's, that's all I'm going to say. So you can really do an outstanding job in communicating those benefits to customers making sure that the way those products get to the final consumer is appropriate and pricing them right. And if the situation changes, right, if COVID-19 hits uh, your company and changes the way everything is going or happening around you, you're gonna have to adjust your marketing mix, right? If you're a restaurant right now, you're gonna have to make sure that, you know, you're taking measures to minimize the risk so that your customers are gonna feel comfortable coming in, right? And maybe you're gonna have to install and you're going to limit, for example, seating, right, which is, you know, painful for the bottom line because your capacity is going to be reduced. On the other hand, it's going to enable you to stay open, right? So your marketing mix is going to have to be changing accordingly. You're going to have to let customers know about it so they can actually make the right decisions. And this is it.